The history of using video cassette recorders as a digital audio storage medium began in 1977 when Sony introduced its PCM adapter, the SemiPro PCM1, followed by its professional counterparts, the PCM1600 in 1979, the PCM1610 in 1980, and the PCM1630 in 1985. By the late 70s, 3M produced a 1-inch 32-track, and by 1980, quarter-inch stereo machines came on the scene, starting with the Mitsubishi X80, the Sony 3202, and the 3402. Other multi-track options gained traction by the mid-80s, including the Sony 3324 and 3348, Mitsubishi's X400 and X800 series, and the Otari DTR900. The DAT format, developed by Sony and introduced in 1987, integrated the PCM adapter with a proprietary miniature video format. DAT quickly gained popularity as several manufacturers jumped on the bandwagon. Throughout the 80s, Tascam, Otari, and Fostex were attempting to straddle the pro and semi-pro markets. Then, in 1990, Tascam introduced the DA800 Sony compatible dash recorder. At approximately half the price of the Sony, Tascam's timing unfortunately coincided with the announcement of the Alesis ADAT, a move that sent Tascam back to the drawing board. In 1993, Tascam announced the competitively priced DA88, recording eight tracks to a high 8 video cassette at either 44.1 kHz or 48 kHz. It became known as the DTRS format. Tascam also produced the PCM800 for Sony. In addition to the DA88, the other 16-bit models are the DA38 and DA98. Up to 16 machines could be synchronized via the rear 15-pin port. Stay there, Wilbur, I'll get it. The DA78HR and the DA98HR are the 24-bit models. All of these machines share the same transport, and while a rotary transformer is how playheads talk to the outside world, the DA88 is the only model that uses slip rings for the record heads. All other models have a rotary transformer on top. The DA88 is the only model with a linear power supply. All subsequent models have a switch mode supply, cutting the weight and power consumption in half. An internal switch sets the voltage range from 100 volts to 240 volts. In this photo, the power wires to the transport have been extended, allowing the transport to be repositioned for better access. And yes, that is a copper-plated steel panel from a DA88. Two common transport problems are caused by stiff lubricant in the tension arm and exit guide pivots. The next slides show the thread motor to the left and the impedance roller in the center. Removing them allows access to the tension arm and manual control of the threading gear. Pay attention to both the exit guide and the tension arm as I manually advance the threading gear. This transport was last serviced by me in 2009. The tension arm lubricant was replaced then and it continues to move freely. To extend head life, the tension slider should be in the relaxed position. The side adjustment sets the tape wrap around the impedance roller. As you can see, the exit guide lubricant has become stiff. The split washer and spring will be removed and a toothpick soaked in alcohol is used to clean the bearing. A cotton swab cleans the post and light oil makes the pivot happy. A note about split washers. Unless you have a supply of them, or a spare mechanism to steal from, do not attempt any repair that requires them. They are quite squarely wee beasties that love to go flying off into another dimension. For any helical tape transport, it is essential that the head only be rotated counterclockwise when cleaned. 99% alcohol is used, but please allow time for the alcohol to evaporate. Next up is the rabbit. What you've got? Spelled with an E-T, the ridge on the stationary part of the head guides the lower edge of the tape. To remove oxide buildup, use a razor blade to create a sharp edge on a toothpick, then soak in alcohol and carefully move along the guide. Three toothpicks were used to show the oxide that was removed. 
cotton swab dipped in alcohol is used to clean the rotary and fixed guides, as well as the pinch roller. It's a good idea to wash your hands to remove any oils that can contaminate the guides. And yes, you are allowed to be more thorough. Consider this a first pass to get the coarse dirt and go back a second time with a fresh cotton swab. This machine was particularly dirty, as you can see. With the mechanism reassembled, it's time to unlock the latch that protects the tape and move it into position. A padlock will hold the tape in place while a separate tape is loaded in the elevator. With the transport in play mode, an adjustment is made to allow the tape to wrap around the impedance roller. The procedure is detailed in the service manual. Note the magnified view of the tension arm, highlighted in green, in particular, notch B. Set the arm position so that the notch is aligned with the chassis edge. Before the pivot guide was cleaned and lubricated, it jammed the mechanism when it attempted to unthread. Pressing the eject button while holding the pivot guide in place simulates the condition so that you can see the resulting error message. The power cycle clears the message and the transport is now happy. The reel tables have magnetic clutches. Under each reel table is an optical strobe disc that is read by an infrared transmitter receiver. A tension tape is used to determine if the clutches need to be cleaned and lubricated. The reversing idler consists of three plastic gears, the whir of which you hear during fast wind. A magnetic clutch under the large gear swings the idler between the supply and take up reel tables. As the cassette is loaded onto the mechanism, it sits over an infrared transmitter. The right red arrow points to the beginning of tape sensor, and the left red arrow points to the end of tape sensor. While on the topic of sensors, just right of center is the beginning of tape sensor. The mode switch reports transport status. If the deck is brought in from the cold, the dew sensor detects condensation, and at the end of Diagon Alley is the infrared transmitter. All of these and more are scanned by the system control processor. The failure of any to report within its time window will generate a specific error message. The service manual provides all of the basic alignment procedures as well as access to hidden features. Simultaneously pressing fast forward, stop and play on power up followed by the stop button puts the machine in test mode. Pressing the shift and increment buttons accesses the PG delay adjustment. Tape path begins as the tape leaves the cassette and ends upon its return. Our focus will be on the entrance and exit guides on either side of the head drum. After solving the common mechanical issues in part one, let's see how to observe the tape path using an oscilloscope. To determine if playback issues are the fault of the tape or of the machine, Connect an oscilloscope to the RF envelope and head switching test points. The oscilloscope locks to the head switching signal. Note that the A and B heads carry a redundant signal for error correction. A number 00 Phillips screwdriver loosens the post roller set screws. A special tool is used to optimize the height of the entrance guide, which affects the left side of the envelope, while the exit guide affects the right side of the envelope. The oscilloscope has now been set to 10 times magnification. Shift the PG delay using the up-down buttons until the start of the RF envelope is 250 microseconds to the right of the head switching pulse transition. This adjustment would be reset every time the head is changed or if the memory had been corrupted. To access the error rate display, press Shift. The LED will blink, and press menu until BER OFF appears. Press the up or down buttons to enable or disable this feature. The playback condition LED will blink when enabled. Meters 1, 2, and 5, 6 will now indicate head errors during play mode. Press shift to return to the normal display. 
Here are some suggestions for transferring DTRS tapes. Bake tapes in advance at 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 48 hours or as needed. Use an external thermometer to confirm dehydrator accuracy. Preheat the tapes to 100 degrees Fahrenheit just before transfer. Capture at the native sample rate using a TDIF to ADAT optical format converter such as the Tascam TDIF-1 slash IFTAD or the Otari UFC-24. P.S. The workstation should be slaved to the DTRS. When the question arises as to whether the tape and or machine condition will not allow tapes to be transferred at once, transfer tapes one at a time. The Motu digital timepiece derives native sync from Tascam 15 pin and 8 at 9 pin. The Steinberg Nuendo sync station has 8 at 9 pin and SEMTI. Interface either of these with MIDI bridge software. The ability to slave the DAW to a single machine via timecode allows session tapes to be captured one at a time and in sync. If a problem tape arises, it's possible to back up and punch into a capture, smoothing out edits after the fact. Of all the videotape-based options, Tascams is the better format because of its superior transport and firmware. That said, the DA88 has aged out. It's basically a parts machine due to leaky capacitors. If your DA88 is still functioning, cool. The purpose of this video was to shed light on what's under the hood. You can slow it down or repeat sections as needed. There's so much I left out. Email questions to edaudio at tangible-technology.com. Check out my other videos here. You'll find DAT, ADAT, and analog tape tips at my website. Thanks to Dan Johnson for the dash picks, Jason Bittner for transfer and sync tips, and thank you for watching. Be sure to hit the subscribe button because there's more to come.